before we go any further, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land that we're meeting on tonight and to pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. Tonight, we've got with us two expert panellists who are going to be answering your questions. We've got Scott Jacobs and Alita Wilman, and I will get them to introduce themselves very shortly. Uh, we've also got Cass Strakosh, who is working behind the scenes to help get your questions answered tonight. So tonight, we'll be talking about the National Disability Insurance Scheme, or NDIS, which is a new way of providing support and services to people with disability aged under 65. So our panellists are going to be talking to us about uh, what the NDIS is and how it works and the types of supports that you might be able to access under the new scheme. We're also going to be talking about how you can prepare to transition to the NDIS when it arrives in your region. So we'll try to get to as many of your questions as possible um, in the time that we have available. There's a couple of ways for you to ask a question. You can type it into the chat window, which uh, is part of the Zoom window that you're in for this, that you're watching this webinar in. So just type in your question and uh, click on submit and we'll get it here in the chat window. You can also email us at webinar at visionaustralia.org. That's W-E-B-I-N-A-R at visionaustralia.org. But let's um, go to our expert panellists. So Scott and Alida, I might get you each to introduce yourself. So Scott, we'll start with you. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your role at Vision Australia and the work you're doing with the NDIS at the moment? Sure, so I'm Scott Jacobs. I'm NDIS lead for Vision Australia, uh, and I'm helping to coordinate our work and response to make sure that our services are equipped to respond to the NDIS and help meet clients such as yourselves get the best outcomes that you can from engaging with the new system. Fantastic, thank you very much. And Alita, how about you? Can you tell us a bit about your role and uh, the work that you're doing with the NDIS at the moment? No problem. So my name's Alita Wilman and I'm the NDIS National Program Development Lead. I work with Scott as part of Vision Australia's NDIS team to work alongside both Vision Australia clients and staff to navigate the NDIS and to get the most out of their plans. Excellent. Thank you very much. All right. So Scott and Alita are going to start by giving us an overview of the NDIS, um, what it is and how it works. So Scott, we might throw to you first on this one, I think. Sounds good. So, the National Disability Insurance Scheme, NDIS, is a new way of providing support for people with disability, their families and their carers as well. It uses a no-fault insurance model, which is quite similar to Medicare, to provide support and services to people with a disability. The NDIS is a shift away from previous block funding of disability services to what's called an individualised funding model. The NDIS allocates funding to individuals based on their level of need and the self-defined goals that you set. It also encourages you to use this funding to purchase the supports and services that most effectively meet your needs. The biggest practical change for you is that people with disability can now choose the providers they want to work with. So with that in mind, the NDIS has two key goals for you as participants. It's to cover the reasonable and necessary support costs for a person with a disability, depending on their individual goals and needs. And it's also to give people with a disability choice and control over the supports that they receive and where and when they access those supports. The NDIS began with three trial sites around Australia from July 2013. It's being rolled out gradually around the rest of Australia from last July 2016. The National Disability Insurance Agency, the NDIA, is responsible for delivering the NDIS. When it is fully operational, over 460,000 Australians with a disability will be covered by the NDIS. Okay, great. Oh, Scott, you so, go on. Yes, no, still more. So we'll talk a little bit about how it works in practice for you as well. And sure. go into more detail about that later on in the session too. Uh, depending on the goals and the needs that you set, participants get funding for a wide range of supports, including core supports, transport, assistive technology, um, and improved daily living. We'll go into what some of those are in more detail as well. The participant can then choose organisations to provide support for them, instead of what happened in the past, where people would often only have one or two choices to access all of their supports. 
A participant in the NDIS goes through a range of steps in order to access services through the scheme. Uh, again, we'll flesh these out as we go through, but at a high level, first of all, you check your availability. Is the NDIS available in your area? You can place an access request form, although this is not required if you are currently receiving disability services. In that case, the NDIS will contact you. You can place an evidence of disability form. You can also conduct some preparation or pre-planning before you meet with the NDIS, NDIS planner, and we highly recommend that. You can then attend a planning session with the NDIA or the local area coordinator, also known as the LAC or LAC. Uh, and finally, you'll receive your plan and get to select your service provider as well. Okay. Uh, that's great. And I think that's a, a really good um, high level overview of the scheme. And as Scott mentioned, we'll talk to some of those steps a lot more as we go through the discussion tonight. We've got uh, a few questions from the community uh, which have come in and um, you can each jump in and, and answer these as you see fit. The first question we've got is from Rocky who asks whether the NDIS is compulsory. No, so the NDIS is not compulsory. You can access it when and if you need to. However, in the future, because this is the main way that services and support services for people with disability are funded, you may find that you have to access the NDIS if you want to continue accessing services. Okay, great. Um, and Margaret asks, um, will the NDIS affect my disability support pension? No. Nope. You, um, you can rest assured, Margaret, that your disability support pension is considered entirely separate to the NDIS. So it doesn't matter what level of funding you receive in the NDIS, as long as your other circumstances are still eligible for the disability support pension, you can keep getting that too. Okay, great. And uh, Fred says that he will be too old when the NDIS rolls out in his area, and he's wondering what happens then. Yeah, it is unfortunate, but the scheme is only available for people under 65. However, if you are over 65, there's still options for support. You can go through the aged care system and you can always work with providers like Vision Australia to identify your needs and continue accessing the support that you require. Okay, great. Um, we've also had a couple of questions around travel. Um, one person wants to know, uh, Stefan wants to know whether um, he'll automatically lose his mobility allowance payment when the NDIS becomes available in his region. So the answer to that one is no, you won't lose your mobility allowance when the NDIS comes out. Once you join the NDIS, uh, the mobility allowance is removed, but you get additional transport supports in your plan that are intended to cover what the mobility allowance covered. So if you don't join the scheme, you can continue to access it. If you do, you'll get replacement supports. Okay, and we've also had a question around what happens to the um, taxi subsidy scheme, and that question was from Brad. Sure. So the taxi subsidy scheme is remaining in place. Um, even if you join the NDIS, you can continue to access it. Uh, we're also working behind the scenes to try and encourage various governments to put some more consistency around the taxi subsidy scheme and ensure that it does remain in place into the future as well. Okay. Great. Um, all right, so we might um, move on to our next topic now. And just before we do, um, I can see quite a few questions coming in in the chat window. So we'll get to as many of those as we can uh, as we go through the discussion. Um, just a reminder that you can type your question into the chat window there in Zoom, or you can email webinar at visionaustralia.org to answer your question. So we might talk a little bit now about those steps to accessing the NDIS that you referred to earlier. Um, let's talk about how you work out whether you're eligible for the NDIS and the process for sort of accessing supports under the new scheme. Um, Alida, how does, how does that all work? Sure, thanks. So I guess, as we said earlier, since July 2016, the NDIS has been rolling out across Australia and it's introduced in stages and that's to make sure that it's both successful and sustainable. So people will enter the NDIS differently uh, depending on where they live and the type of support that they currently receive. There's also a set of eligibility requirements and everyone gets assessed on their individual circumstances. However, broadly, to be eligible, you have to be both under 65 when you first access the NDIS, 
you need to be in need of support for everyday tasks because of a permanent impairment or condition that has a functional impact on your day-to-day uh, -day living. You also have to be an Australian citizen, a permanent resident, or a New Zealand citizen holding a protected special category visa. So the NDIS is limited to people who are under 65 years of age. However, you can age with the scheme. So what this means is if you become a participant, you can continue to access the scheme after you turn 65, right up until you enter residential care. So now I might just quickly talk through the processes of applying to the NDIS. So we talked, Scott's talked a little bit around eligibility, whether you might be eligible to access, but how do you get that eligibility assessed? So the NDIS have slightly different processes for application, depending on whether you're already receiving disability support services prior to the NDIS rolling out in your region. So if you have been in receipt of disability support services that were funded by either the state or federal governments, the NDIA will contact you to begin the planning process once the NDIS starts rolling out in your area. Vision Australia provides uninterrupted service to our current clients that are transitioning from those state and federally funded schemes through to the NDIS. On the flip side, if you haven't been accessing disability support services or perhaps you haven't been accessing them regularly in a while, then you'll need to contact the NDIA directly. You can do those in a couple of ways. One is via phone, and I know this will be part of the notes that we send out after the webinar, but the number to contact the agency directly is 1800 800 110. You can also drop into one of their office locations. Um, what they'll do is they'll run through that eligibility criteria with you, the criteria Scott just went through, and if they deem you eligible in that first run through, they'll give you an application form, which is known as the access request form. This application form will ask you to give a couple of your personal contact details, including the area you live in, again, to assess your eligibility, to make sure the scheme is coming into your area. You can also submit an access request form up to six months prior to the rollout date of your area. The form asks you to provide evidence of your disability. So be sure to include any reports or assessments that you have access to. Um, we recommend an ophthalmologist's report as one of the best pieces of evidence that our clients can take to the NDIS. Any evidence of disability, though, needs to note the permanent and significant nature of your disability. Ideally, it would also detail the functional impact that your disability has on your day-to-day -day life. Vision Australia is here to help you gather that evidence, fill the form out, and we can also help you submit it back to the NDIA. Once you have submitted it to the NDIA, they will contact you by a letter to let you know whether or not you have been accepted into the scheme. If you've not been accepted, the NDIA gives you the option to appeal this decision and Vision Australia can help you with the appeals process if you'd like. If you have been accepted onto the scheme, you'll receive a letter with your participant number and will then be contacted to set up a time for you to have your planning meeting. Okay. Great. Um, thanks for um, for those great insights, guys. I think that's really helpful. And uh, we've had quite a lot of questions coming in. Um, John says that uh, he only has a month to go before he turns 65. And he's wondering whether his application for the NDIS will be voided. So I'm assuming John might have already applied um, to be part of the NDIS, but he's wondering what will happen if his uh, application isn't processed in the next month before he turns 65. Are either of you able to shed any light on that? Yep, I can do that. So basically, look, if John, you've, you've put your application in, your area has is within six months of its rollout, then they're going to be looking the date that you submitted that application as well. So as long as you're under 65 when you're submitting that application, then if you're deemed to be eligible, that decision will stand and you'll be able to enter the scheme. Okay, great. Um, and David's wondering whether you can join the scheme early or do you have to wait till it goes live in your region? How does that work? Yeah, I can take that one as well, if you like. So basically, as I said, so if it's if the NDIS is live in your LGA region, so your local government area, then definitely you can apply straight away. Um, and as I said, you can apply up to six months prior to that stated rollout date. The NDIS have those dates available on their website. Okay, great. Um, William's also asking whether if you've already been diagnosed as legally blind, um, do you then have to provide evidence again to apply for the NDIS? It's a really good question, William, and one we get commonly from our clients as well. So look, it's, a, it's, a, it's I guess, a, a different, two different scenarios. So if, William, you're receiving disability support services currently at the moment, then 
that is taken into account. So the NDI are contacting you and I guess there's less of a burden of evidence and proof of disability if you're already receiving those state and federally funded services in your area. If you're not and you're applying as a new participant to the NDIS, then yes, you'll need to provide as much evidence as you can. And for us, best practice would be to, to gather together as much of the evidence around specialist assessments and about your vision conditions as you've got access to, to give yourself the best chance of getting onto the scheme the first time. Okay, great. We've also had uh, a bit of a related question, I guess, from Sharon, um, who's wondering what sort of information uh, needs to go in a letter from her ophthalmologist if she gets one uh, as part of her evidence of, of disability. So any letter or evidence from your ophthalmologist just needs to state the nature of your disability, uh, whether there is a specific medical condition behind it, and also ideally what the functional impact would be on your vision as well. Okay, great. All right. Um, we might talk about uh, our next topic, which is getting plan ready. So getting ready to do your NDIS plan. Um, and I guess really your individual plan is the key to accessing funding and supports under the NDIS. So we're going to talk about ways for you to prepare um, for that planning process and get the most out of it. So Scott, what are some of the things that people might want to think about as they're getting ready to do their NDIS plan? Sure. So as with everything, obviously preparation is particularly important and to get ready for your planning meeting for the NDIS, it can be really helpful to start thinking about the supports you get now, both the formal and the informal supports, and then what you would like to achieve. So think about the things you currently do and what you would like to do in the future. And then think about what you might need in order to enable you to do those things. Some of these might be daily activities, others you might only do every couple of months. Because when you meet with the NDIA, they'll ask for that information about the type of support you currently receive. And as Scott said, this includes not just the funded disability support services from providers like Vision Australia, but any mainstream support services you might access, like your GP, assistance in the home, counselling, community activities, and any informal supports that you receive, support from your family and friends to attend medical appointments, work, or even social activities. It's helpful to have those supports written down and recorded and so you make sure that you don't forget any and you can explain all of those to the planner. If you have evidence of those supports, like such as assessments that providers might have done with you, then taking those to your planning meeting is a good idea. But don't worry if you don't have that information. So typically a plan for the NDIS will last for about 12 months. So when you're starting to think about what goals you might have, think about them over that lifespan and then also the ones into the future too. The NDIS plan allocates supports based on those goals, the ones you set for your life and for the immediate plan. NDIS has eight outcome domains and each of these domains list that we're gonna talk through will help you to think about the different areas of your life and the goals you might need to set for them. Thinking in this way can help you to communicate to the planner what your goals and support needs might be. So the eight outcome domains are, and they're available on the NDIA website as well, are daily living, home, health and wellbeing, lifelong learning, work, social and community participation, relationships, and choice and control. So when you're going through this process, you might think for each of those areas, and for instance, one of them, you may think what you currently do around your community and decide that there are more events or community groups that you would like to participate in and set a goal related to that. Okay, great. Um, so we've uh, had a couple of questions from people um, about the the pre-planning process. Um, Pam says, are there any tools that I can use to help me to pre-plan for the NDIS and sort of hear about what other people have successfully applied for? That's a yeah, great question, Plan, and looking to get organised already. So that's a good sign for your planning meeting. So look, I think I would first I would say that with regards to supports that other participants might have gotten, the NDIS are really focused on making sure this plan fits your needs, your goals, and your functions. So it's really important to keep that in mind when you're going into the planning meeting. So uh, no two participants' NDIS plans will be alike, even with similar disabilities and levels of disability, because everyone's goals and function and support framework that they've got around 
around them can be very different. Uh, tools that you can use to um, prepare for your planning meetings. There's a couple. So some, there are some tools available on the NDIS website to get start sketching out your life and look at those informal and mainstream family and friend supports as well as any funded supports. Vision Australia also has a service with our service engagement consultants in which we can sit down with you and talk through those goals and the services that you're receiving and produce a document that you'll be able to take to your planning meeting to support you. Okay, great. And that probably answers a, a related questions that we've had um, from a couple of people uh, such as Lynn, who've asked whether if they've got additional disabilities as well as low vision, whether that will kind of influence their plan or change um, uh, what that plan looks like. So um, I guess what you're saying is it's quite individualised for everyone. Is that is that right? That's definitely right. Yeah. So it's important with NDIS that we we know that people with a disability may have more than one disability as well. It's important to provide evidence of all your disabilities that you're looking to have recognised by the NDIS as well, because that makes sure that the plan really fits your needs and your life. And because the way that those disabilities might intersect and the kind of problems that you might face or the type of goals that you might have and the supports that you might need to get to there. So support letters or um, information and reports from all the different types of specialists you might be in contact with as much as you can gather evidence we would suggest that you gather that as well. Okay, fantastic. All right, uh, if you've just logged in, by the way, welcome to our intro to the NDIS webinar. And uh, if you would like to ask a question, you can email it to webinar at visionaustralia.org or you can type it into the chat window there in uh, your Zoom software that you're using to watch us live from the Enfield Vision Australia office tonight. Okay, so we've talked through some of the steps for uh, applying for the NDIS and working out whether you're eligible. Um, we've also talked through some of the, the things around pre-planning and making sure you've um, thought about that process and what your goals are and things like that to get the most out of it. Um, can we now talk a little bit about the planning meeting? Um, are you able to give a, a brief idea of um, what a planning meeting might typically look like, I guess, and what will happen for participants during that session? Alida, I think I'm throwing to you on this one. <laughs> go for it. Either of us, I'm sure, can hopefully answer that one. So look, in the planning meeting, you'll go through your current supports. So all that information you've gathered is going to be really useful for the planner when you're sitting down in that meeting. They'll talk about your goals, your needs, and the support that you need to meet those goals. The goal setting is really important because it determines the supports that get included in your plan. For instance, if your goal might be to independently travel to community activities, then the planner might work with you to identify what supports you currently have and what you might need to meet that goal. So this might mean funding for transport, orientation and mobility, and some assistive technology to help navigate your way. It's important to remember that every plan will be different, even if you have similar goals. When you go into the planning meeting, there's some fairly common things that you should expect to occur, although they'll vary a little bit in the process and the steps that might happen, depending on what region you're in. The five key things that are likely to occur. The first one, you'll discuss what your goals and aspirations might be for the life of the plan and beyond. You'll have an assessment of your level of function and your support needs. This generally takes the form of a questionnaire which is structured around those eight outcome domains that we ran through earlier. You then create a plan of supports to help you identify how you can progress towards the goals that you set. You decide how you want to manage the plan and when the plan is going to be reviewed. At the moment, that's typically every 12 months. And final step is the NDIA will review, approve and implement your plan. So the planning meeting itself is generally run by people known as local area coordinators. They're the LACs we mentioned earlier. Their job is to gather as much information as they need about your life and the services you need to reach your goals and send them to, your, to the NDIS to create a plan. This varies slightly for the early childhood space as there's an early access approach to ensure easy access to early intervention services for children. So it will be slightly different for families and carers. When you go to this planning meeting, no matter what level or what type, you are able to take a support person along with you. 
if that's what you want. You can also request that the planning meeting be held in person instead of over the phone. And we strongly request, recommend that you do request a face-to-face -face meeting as it can be a lot easier to share documents and to be able to communicate your experiences in a face-to-face -face setting. If you would like a Vision Australia representative to attend you alongside you at your planning meeting, we're more than happy to do that. And you can contact us to book a time. Okay, fantastic. Um, we've um, had quite a few questions um, about the planning process from the community. Uh, Pauline is wondering how many goals can you set or should you set as part of your plan? Sure. So with your plan, typically you can set as many as you like. Your first plan is likely to only include two main goals and then two subsidiary goals. I think the, it can be hard sometimes to work out exactly the steps that it will take, but generally your first plan is about getting you set up in the NDIS, understanding how it works and starting to access supports in the new way of working. So the two goals that you're setting originally may not be the kind of, this is where I want to be in 10 years time, but might help you build some of the skills and get the supports you need to start yourself along that journey. Okay, great. And um, Sharon is interested in the planning process for her child as part of the NDIA. She's wondering whether the NDIA would want to interview her child um, as part of that planning meeting. Are you able to sort of shed any light on how that generally works for younger sure. participants? Yeah, so there's two different levels for children. The first one is the early childhood, early intervention approach, which has a very specialized um, assessment process and early intervention to ensure that children get access to services as early as possible to avoid developmental delays. That one is for ages zero up to age six. And so that has a particular entry pathway. You probably won't be needing the planner to have conversations with your child. Older children, certainly once they're into primary school and high school, may be involved in the planning process. Depends on what you're interested in having them, uh, what level they have, what level of engagement you want them to have. Um, but there's certainly the families and the carers and the parents in particular are the key people who help identify and uh, communicate the goals for the child's development. Okay, um, we've had another question around planning for um, children under the NDIS as well from a parent who's got a child who's um, been diagnosed with a degenerative vision condition, um, who's not really had any changes in their vision at the moment, but they're wondering if they could look at pre-planning um, for things like, uh, for example, for her to learn braille and those kinds of things. Um, so how does that work with, um, with conditions like that one? Sure. So that one again depends on the age. If it's zero to six, then you will probably be able to access the early pathway because they do like to try and put in those really early intervention services to try and lower the developmental delays that may result from a degenerative condition. Mm -hmm. If they're over that, certainly once they get into teen years, it's less likely. They do still take into account that functional vision and the level of your vision impairment. You should hopefully still be able to access some services, but you may not quite meet the threshold for NDIS access at that point. Okay, great. We've also had a question from Adam who's wondering if you can provide any information about planning um, for people with dog guides. Certainly. So assistance animals and seeing eye dogs are funded under the NDIS. Ultimately, and it seems a little bit strange, they're considered a piece of assistive technology or an aids and equipment in the old language. Uh, and the reason for that is that they're a tool effectively, in this case an animal, that helps you to navigate the built environment. They will fund it. You need to make sure that it is right for you and given that it is an expensive piece of equipment, the NDIS likes to have some strong justification as to why it's the right tool for you. And that comes back to what your goals might be. So if you're thinking about how you might be able to get your dog supported through the NDIS, then thinking about what goals you might set that a dog would be particularly important for you to be able to do that. The NDIS will pay for some of the ongoing um, costs of feeding and maintaining an assistance animal or seeing eye dog as well. And we're happy to help you because that particular process can be a little bit challenging sometimes. So more than happy to provide advice if you want to get in touch. Okay, so maybe people looking at that as an option should contact um, their local Vision Australia Centre to have a chat with somebody about how the process works. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, 
Anna is also wondering if she can purchase technology or orthoptist services as part of her plan. Sure, Anna. And the answer is a big resounding yes, you can with NDIS plans. So obviously, as Scott said, you'll have goals in your plan that would be around technology and what you might be using the technology for. And that would then translate into funding in your plan that you're able to use to fund an assistive technology assessment, an orthoptic assessment if you're looking for that, and then possibly even fund the aids and equipment that might be recommended from those assessments. Okay, fantastic. All right, um, some great questions there. So thanks to everyone who's um, sent in a question. You're certainly keeping us on our toes, which is fantastic. All right, let's go to our next topic, um, which is all about receiving your NDIS plan. So we're now going to talk about what your NDIS plan might look like when you receive it and the types of information that will be in there. So Scott, can you tell us a little bit about what a typical NDIS plan looks like? Sure. So, and brace yourselves, this section is a little bit longer. We'll go through what your NDIS plan is, what it looks like, how you might be able to start using it once you do get it as well. Ultimately, a plan is the individualised plan for a participant in the scheme. It's based on that planning meeting that you've been through, and it should reflect your goals and your supports. After that planning process has been completed, you'll be sent an NDIS plan, which then outlines the supports and the fundings available to you for the time of your plan, which again is typically one year. You can then choose to use that funding at the service provider or organisation that you want. So the question we get then is what will be funded in my plan? So NDIS funding is available for things such as daily living support, equipment, technology, and skills training for life and wellbeing. In short, it will fund to acquire the support that's reasonable and necessary for you to live an ordinary life. It will take into account the support that you already have, that you've discussed with your planner, including things that are part of your family life or connections that you have with friends or community services. And now the um, less fun one, which is what is not funded in my plan. And this one is that the NDIS will only fund those supports that are specific to your disability. It won't cover day-to-day -day living costs and it won't duplicate the supports that should be available to you um, so it won't replace mainstream services like health and education. Okay so I'm going to give you a bit of a general picture of the format of a typical NDIS plan and given that this is the format that we're seeing at the moment as well. So part one of your plan includes a picture of your day-to-day -day life and the people who support you. Uh, part two describes your goals as Scott said, we generally have those two overall goals that are included on your first plan for the life, that 12 month life of your plan with space for your longer term goals and aspirations. Part three then describes those informal supports that we talked about. So family, friends, your community and mainstream supports like your eye specialist community group, as well as the funded supports, so the meat of your NDIS plan. So those funded supports, they're typically split into three main purposes. So core, capital, and capacity building. So I'll go through each of those in turn and just quickly explain what they are and the types of services that get funded in each of those purposes. So core supports um, enable a participant, which is what you'll become when you become part of the scheme, to complete activities of daily living, to work towards the goals and meet their objectives in daily life. Services that get typically funded through your core supports are things like cleaning, lawn maintenance, or support workers. So there's four main support budgets that they call them underneath that core support purpose. So those budgets, which again are available on the NDIS website with more information, is assistance with daily life, transport, consumables, and assistance with social and community participation. The great thing about your core funding is it can be used flexibly between those categories to meet your needs. We then move to the second and a little less flexible support purpose of capital funding. So the NDIS see this as an investment and it's an investment in assistive technology, equipment, those home and vehicle modifications. So it's funding for those capital costs. The third is capacity building. So capacity building supports enable participants to build their independence and skills to achieve those goals that you set in your plan. 
There are nine different support budgets in your capacity building support purpose, and I won't list them all here, um, but these are intended, they're used for their intended purpose. So they're not flexible between them, they must be used for their purpose. So budgets like improved daily living skills are used to pay for specialist assessments and training, like orientation and mobility training or occupational therapy assessments. Most of Vision Australia services fall under either the capital for assistive technology or capacity building support areas. So while all this probably sounds quite complex, the good news is the NDIS is going to be around for a while, so you'll get the chance to learn and hopefully pick up all the terminology. And the next big one that we'll send to you is reasonable and necessary decision making. And this is a really key one to try and bear in mind. The support available under the NDIS is designed to enable you to connect with your community gain employment and live an ordinary life. The NDIA makes decisions about what support to fund based on whether it is reasonable and necessary for you to live an ordinary life. They decide whether a piece of equipment or a service is reasonable and necessary based on a couple of things, including the NDIS Act and their operational guidelines. However, broadly, equipment and services funded through the NDIS must be related to your disability cannot include day-to-day -day living costs that are not related to your disability support needs, should represent value for money, needs to be, or it has to be likely to be efficient, effective and beneficial to the participant, and it should take into account what informal supports might already be given to you by your families, carers, networks and the general community. So the NDIS uses reasonable and necessary decision making when they're putting together your plan and whether they're deciding whether to approve equipment or services recommended in a report. So we'll take a deep breath because we're halfway. Uh, we've gone through that reasonable and necessary decision making. You know what's in a, typically in a plan and the types of services that you can purchase with that funding. So now we're going to talk about how you go about using the plan. Uh, the first um, and really important area is to talk about that the NDIA know that the NDIS is a big change in the way that support is provided to participants. So everyone, everyone who gets a plan receives support from the NDIA to understand what's in their plan and to get them started. The majority of participants will receive help from their local area coordinator, that same person who sat down and had the planning conversation with you. The LACs will help to explain your plan, what the funding can be used for, and how to engage organisations to provide the services and equipment that you need. Some participants who have more complex situations will instead receive funding in their plan for a support coordinator. Support coordinators do all the things that an LAC would do. They explain the plan, explain the process to engage organisations, but they're also there to resolve points of crisis, to negotiate with different providers and to build your capacity to manage and understand your NDIS plan. Okay, fantastic. And just one last thing, sorry, Caitlin. Point no, carry on. So the last part is around the My Place participant portal and how you go about engaging a service provider. So once you've got your plan, that means that you have control over which organisations you want to spend it with, how you want to access services. All the information in your NDIS plan is also available on a secure portal known as My Place. On My Place, you're able to access information about how much funding you have left and the providers you'd like to work with through the Provider Finder tool. Your LAC, Local Area Coordinator, and the Support Coordinator can also guide you through using the My Place portal, or you can choose to directly approach service providers like Vision Australia yourself. Once you've found the organisation you want to provide you some services, you typically meet with them to discuss your needs and goals, discuss the types of services which you'd like to purchase, and then draw up a service agreement. And that's the agreement between yourself and a provider that details the funding you want to spend with them and the expectation of services that you'll receive in return for that. If your plan is agency managed, uh, then those organisations can use the information you agree to in the service agreement to create what's known as a service booking on the portal and that allows them to be paid. Again, you can check in on the portal to have a look and see what that means as well. Okay, great. And we've had quite a lot of questions come in on this topic, so we might go to some of those now. It's a pretty popular area, as you can imagine. Um, and Scott, I might throw to you on this first one. Um, we've had a couple of questions about the My Place portal that you were just talking about. Um, one person's wondering whether they can only use the providers that they can see on there, or is it okay for them to uh, approach other providers that aren't on the portal? 
No, you can uh, approach other providers. There's a, it can get a little bit complex. Um, if you're managing your own funds, if you're what's called self-managed, then you can access anyone. The only difference is if they're not a registered provider, then they have to pay GST and you have to pay GST. So it might be a little bit more expensive to use those services. Uh, with the portal that will represent most providers uh, and is usually a good way to help find the ones that are currently engaged in the NDIS and will be best able to sort of negotiate and understand what your needs might be as well. Okay, great. Um, we've also had a question about how accessible the My Place portal is for someone who's blind or has low vision. Yeah, unfortunately at the moment it's not accessible. We have been uh, pushing the NDIS and government quite hard around My Place portal, but also other accessibility things in relation to the NDIS. We do expect some good news to be coming out in a couple of weeks and bear in mind that's mid-September for anyone listening back to this in the future. Um, hopefully I've been proved correct. The NDIS My Place portal itself um, is still not ex fully accessible and at this stage we're not entirely sure when it will be. Okay. All right, sounds like we are uh, still got a little bit of work to do on that one. Um, Alita, I might throw to you on this next question, which is from Raylene, and she's wondering about what the process is for assessing and purchasing assistive technology under your plan. Sure. So basically what will usually happen for an NDIS participant is that you would have funding in your plan for a specialist assessment. So for someone to sit down with you and go through your needs, your function, trial with you different pieces of equipment, and at the end of that, write a report for the NDIS stating which piece of equipment worked best for you and why, and how that piece of equipment is going to help achieve the goals that you set for your NDIS plan. And what the NDIS will then do once that um, specialist assessor has submitted that report through to them is that they'll assess that report based on those reasonable and necessary guidelines that Scott and I were discussing earlier. So they're going to look at whether the piece of equipment's related to your disability, if it's value for money, um, and the type of um, impact it's going to have as well. So mm -hmm. they'll make a reasonable and necessary decision on that and they'll call you directly as a participant to let you know if that piece of equipment was approved or not. If it's not approved, there is a process by which you can review and we can assist you with that as well at Vision Australia to go through that reviews process if you'd like to. But if you get the good news and the piece of equipment's approved, then you'll also be able to purchase that equipment using some assistive technology funding that's in your plan. Okay. Um, we've also had a technology question from Crystal, who's wondering what happens uh, if she's already done her plan and then finds out sort of six months later that she has a need for something like, say, a Braille display. Um, what would happen um, then if she needed to purchase something that sort of didn't come up when she originally did the plan? How would that work? If it's okay, we might park that one until we get to the next section because we'll sure. talk about plan reviews and the process for them, both expected and unexpected reviews. Okay, no worries. Um, we've also had a question about um, like complementary therapies for health and wellbeing and whether they can be funded as part of an NDIS plan or would they come more under the general sort of um, health services that you were talking about before that might be excluded? Sure. So, and this is, comes down to what is considered a healthcare and mm -hmm. what is not. We spoke very briefly around the boundaries between what is a mainstream support or what should be expected to be funded through other systems. If it's something like a complementary medicine that you might be able to get if you had private health cover, then you would expect that to be a healthcare thing rather than specifically related to your disability. So the NDIS won't fund it. Okay, and would something like that um, also apply to things like compression stockings? Because we've had a question from Josh, I think it is, who said he's sort of been toing and froing um, between uh, the NDIA and you know whether that should be funded under general health services. Is that something we've encountered with other clients, as far as you know? Yeah, so I guess I think with with that one around um, different those those pieces of equipment and services that go on the border of health. So the question that you've got to ask is is if is it related to the disability that you're registered to the NDIS with, and mm. is it something that we, you would 
you would use with for the NDIS before you had a plan you would expect the health system to fund so that they're the kind of questions that the NDIS will ask as well around um, making sure that the scheme stays sustainable so they're going to fund things that are related to your disability and improving your function in your day-to-day -day life but they're not there to replace the health system and those acute type of needs as well so it's a bit of a balancing act between the two and when we have those kind of ball line questions we definitely go through to the the NDIA to ask them their opinion on those different types of things and they're really honest conversations that you can have with your planner and the NDIA at any time. Okay great. Uh, we've also had another interesting one um, as you can imagine people are really interested in getting their heads around what can be funded and, and what's not. Um, we've got um, one person wondering whether um, the NDIS would fund things like concrete paths around their house to assist them in sort of safe movement around their home. Sure, so that comes under the capital cost budget that we spoke about earlier and relation to home modifications. If you need modifications to your home that are reasonable and necessary to make it more accessible and make it more friendly and easy for you to be able to navigate around your home without support, then it may well be something that the NDIS would fund. What happens with that is in a similar way to assistive technology, uh, a specialist would do an assessment, determine whether you need a home modification, and then it goes on from there. Okay, no problem. Um, we've also had a, a couple of questions around um, things like talking books and the Vision Australia Library and whether they'll need to be funded under an NDIS plan or um, will they continue to work as they do at the moment? Any thoughts on that one? Yeah, they're going to continue to work as they do at the moment and at the moment there's no expectation that they're going to become a fee for service. Okay. No worries. And Michael was wondering whether there's any un, uh, assistance under the NDIS for carers. I can take that. So um, that's one of those um, domain areas Scott talked about earlier around relationships. So the NDIA are really interested in making sure that people's informal and formal support network. So I'm not sure whether that carer is a paid carer or an informal carer, because obviously carers are both um, and can identify as such with the both areas. Um, so the NDIS are interested in making sure that that relationship, if it is a personal relationship, stays a personal relationship and some of that carer burden is taken away too. So they definitely Definitely don't use that old language around respite, but there are services within an NDIS plan that take into account um, maintaining the network of support that the client has around them, which includes carers. Okay, great. We've also had quite a few questions around funding of iPhones and iPads, and I gather from conversations that we've had off air that there's some complexity around this one. Is that right? Yeah, it is. And it comes down to both reasonable and necessary and what the organise, uh, what the NDIA considers to be a mainstream piece of equipment um, and not specific to disability. For the moment, at the most part, the NDIA is refusing to fund iPhones, iPads and other smart devices. We're doing quite a lot of work in the background to try and help them recognise that there are really clear built-in accessibility functions to those devices and they can access act as a specialist device for people who are blind or have low vision, navigating the environment, the various sort of functions that you have, um, that it might help replace a bunch of other traditionally specialist equipment. For the moment, unfortunately, they aren't approving it, uh, but we are trying to lobby on our clients and others' behalf to improve that situation. Okay. Great. Um, and just uh, as a last question on this topic, Samantha was wondering whether you could explain a little bit more about consumables. Um, she says she thought they were more or less a given in an NDIS plan, um, but uh, she doesn't have any provision for that in her plan. Are you able to sort of shed any, any further light on that for Samantha? Yeah, I can take that. So we might start with just explaining for everyone what that consumables budget means, just so that we know what that jargon yeah. is. And then, then we can go into why it is or isn't there. So um, a consumables budget, as I mentioned earlier, is one of those four support budgets that sits in your core funding. Um, and it's there to fund equipment that's low cost and low risk. So it's the type of equipment that the NDIS expects that someone would perhaps purchase off the internet or walk into a shop and purchase of their own volition rather than through a specialist assessment process that I discussed earlier with Raylene's question. So typically we see for um, a lot of our clients with low vision, they'll receive $1,000 worth of 
consumables funding in that core support budget for low cost, low risk equipment. That's typically the language that we see used by the agency. Um, if it's not there, I would definitely, as a first point of call, go back to my local area coordinator or support coordinator and talk through what has been included in that budget. Is it about the wording? It's just not really quickly recognisable that consumables isn't there? Or can we use my core budget, as I said, it's quite flexible, to purchase those low cost, low risk pieces of equipment that I wanted to use the consumables budget for? If it's completely not there and there are no options to purchase the kind of equipment that you'd be looking to purchase under that, then you would be looking at changing the plan, which would involve a plan review, which is a section we'll be talking about in a moment. Okay, great. Just before we go to that, we've had one more question and I think it's one that a few people might be wondering about. So let's um, take it at this point as well. We've had a question from Brian who um, says that he, you know, feels like he's pretty independent at the moment and he's wondering whether that would kind of impact um, what he might be able to access under the scheme. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, definitely. I, I mean, I think what we like to um, underline with clients of ours that are looking to go towards the NDIS is the NDIS isn't looking for you to downplay your independence or the capacity that you've already built. What they're looking to do is build upon that, upon that great foundation. So it's not a case of needing to play up a disability or play up where um, you might need support. So if it's definitely a choice to be able to access the NDIS and the amount of funding that you're looking to access. So participants when they have a plan have choice and control, complete choice and control over how the funding is used and how much they want to use. So if there were funding in a plan that was more perhaps than you expected, then you're not obliged to use all of that funding just because it's there. So I think it's important to stress that um, the NDIS is there to support you to achieve your goals and how whatever extent those goals will reach. And those goals are diff very different for different people based on their level of vision, their function and just what their life looks like. Okay. Great. All right. Um, we're being pretty bombarded with questions on this topic and I uh, can see why it's an important one to lots of people and we could probably talk about it forever. Um, I'm just wondering, what would you recommend people do if we haven't gotten to their question tonight? Is there, um, who should they contact and um, what can we do about that? So you can either contact the NDIA and they can hopefully give you some advice or you can contact a service provider like Vision Australia if you're already in a client or even if you're not, um, reach out to your local office and we're happy to help you try and identify any issues or answer questions that you might still have after tonight. Okay. Great. All right. Let's talk a little bit about uh, reviewing your NDIS plan. So, um, Scott, how regularly would people need to review their plan and what happens as part of that process? Sure. So as we said earlier, a plan generally only runs for 12 months. And with your first plan, uh, that seems to come up before you know it because it can take a bit of time to get started with the system. Plan reviews will happen any time in the last three months of your plan. So it can be good to get um, prepared and have some information ready in advance. Very similar to the process you go through with getting plan ready before your first plan as well. A plan review meeting is quite similar to that first plan meeting. And it's usually with the same, hopefully, local area coordinator who was in your first meeting as well. The LAC will be asking you whether your living situation or support network has changed and if there have been changes in your daily life. They'll also ask you how you went with your goals and the supports that were included in your plan. And this is where information about the progress that you've made or the barriers you might have encountered are important to note. It's especially important to note the reasons why you may not have used all of the funding in your, a certain area for so far. For instance, you may have been on an extended overseas holiday and therefore you used much lower amounts of core supports for cleaning or garden support than you expected to. Doesn't mean that you're not gonna need them in the future. Finally, the LAC asks you to set new goals for the year ahead and also to note any changes in the types of support you might need to reach those goals. So that's the expected plan reviews every 12 months or so. There's also unexpected plan reviews. These can happen when you feel like you haven't got the supports that you hoped for in your plan. Something new comes up like a different assistive design, device such as the braille refresher display that we talked about earlier. Um, or if something's changed, maybe your circumstances have changed, maybe your goals have changed dramatically and you need to get your plan reviewed to make sure that it matches what your needs are at that point. 
For that process, it's probably best to either have a look on the website or reach out to Vision Australia because it can get a little bit complex going through that unexpected plan review. We're always happy to help you navigate that process, of course. Okay, so would that also apply? Um, we've had a couple of questions from people who are wondering what happens if they um, get a, a, a plan that they're not particularly happy with or that they don't feel meets their needs in terms of the supports that they require. Is that one of those circumstances where you would go through that unexpected review process? Yeah, it is. And it's also certainly with a new plan is usually a little bit quicker and easier to kind of do that initial review if you don't think that the plan that has been given to you covers off the support needs you wanted. Or if you feel like maybe the goals that are mentioned in the planning meeting have not been reflected in your plan, that usually translates to the supports not being quite right. And that's a good time to do a review to make sure you're getting what you need across those 12 months. Okay. And if that sort of doesn't happen for people, is there like an appeals process that, that is generally followed if, if people still sort of aren't getting what they need or how does that work briefly? Yep. Um, much like Daryl Kerrigan, you can take it all the way to the Supreme Court or High Court if you want to, but there's a lot of steps in the meantime. If you don't get the plan review um, that you want, and you don't get the outcome there, you can go to the Administrative Appeals Tribunal and they can reassess your claim and then you can sort of continue on from there depending on what you think, yeah. And I might just add there as well that it's really important too that uh, when you're first looking at a plan, sometimes it might not seem to have included the types of supports that you're looking for, but what the NDIS will always ask for is I guess some evidence that you have explored how you might be able to use that plan to meet the goals, even if it didn't seem like it met them when you first looked at them. So the first step that we'd recommend is that you go back to your local area coordinator and your support coordinator and say, I can't see this here. Can you see it anywhere in my plan? Or is there a way that I can use my plan to get those things that I need and those supports that I'm looking at. So the NDIS are really looking for participants and the support that they've given, been given with the local area coordinators and the support coordinators to really be as creative as they can with the funding that they do have there before they're taking it um, through to being reviewed and going further up the chain. And when you do that as well, you'll definitely get um, a clearer response from the NDIS if you can provide some evidence that I've tried option A, B and C, but it really doesn't meet my needs. You're in a much stronger position to advocate for a change in your plan. Okay, great. Um, we've also had a question about what happens for, um, for example, couples where both partners are vision impaired. Um, is that sort of taken into account in your um, what you, you get in your plan? Like um, the question was, how would something uh, like cleaning services be funded if, for example, both partners might be eligible to be part of the scheme? Sure. So as we talked about earlier, they look at what your informal and formal support networks are, the people you live with, family and friends. So they'll take into account who you work with and who might support you um, in your daily life. You get an individual plan, you set your individual goals. And so they may talk about what each of you are doing. Um, Alita, what about the funding for cleaning? That's an interesting one. I think, I think what I'd say there is um, with that clean support, you want to be um, really clear that the NDIS is looking to promote independence. So it's not looking to apportion chores in a marriage <laughs> or in a relationship. So I think it's really important to underline there that if the supports are for your goals, you may have similar goals to your partner and that's fine. You might get some similar supports that's also fine. But the NDIS aren't looking at you as a package. They're looking at you as individuals. And it's really important that perhaps if you aren't the one that always does the cleaning, perhaps, and there is more, the, you would think there'd be more cleaning in a partner's plan, but you want to be more independent. You want to do more of that, perhaps, if your vision levels are possibly different as well, then funding should be put into your plan to meet that goal, to make sure that you're able to do the share of that housework that you'd like to do as well. So it's all about that goal and negotiating the supports that go with those goals. And they're not, they're done, I guess, with your family and the support network in mind, but with your independence at the centre. Okay, great. Sounds like there could be some interesting family arguments about housework in store for uh, <laughs> a few people. Good times. Um, okay, just uh, coming back to the plan review process. We've had a question from Kathy, um, who says that she's got a plan review coming up and she's just wondering what preparation she should be doing for that. Sure. 
So we kind of covered that to some extent where we were talking around how it is quite similar to the preparation for your initial plan planning meeting. Think about the supports you're getting, think about the supports you're wanting, think about the goals that you're going to have. Um, and very similarly with a plan review, think about what you've received and what services you've accessed with your plan and what you would like to change in the future. Also thinking about things like maybe I didn't use all of my plans, but there are good reasons for that and providing a bit of evidence to it. You might take some assessments with you, you might take reports, you can also take some um, evidence that you have gathered over the life of the plan, the things that you've used, the things you've accessed, community groups you might access, registrations you have, things like that. And I would also just add that you can also take a service provider or a support person as well. So a plan review meeting is, is very similar to your first planning meeting. So you don't have to go there on your own as well. You can have a cast of thousands in the room. We have had people with multiple support people and organisations in the room as well. So if you feel that that would be the best way to communicate the outcomes that you've achieved and the goals that you've got for your next plan, you can definitely have some support in the room. Okay, fantastic. We might finish with a, a bit of a general um, reflection and I, I might call on um, one or both of you, whoever's happy to answer on this one. We've had quite a few questions coming in from people during the course of the session um, who are sort of wondering, I guess anecdotally, whether we've heard about any um, particular advantages or disadvantages from clients who've joined the NDIS, um, you know, people sort of worrying whether they might be a little bit micromanaged by the NDIA in their plan and whether joining for them will really be a good thing. Is, is there anything um, kind of anecdotally you can tell us about how clients have found the experience so far? Sure. Broadly, it seems to be quite positive. It's challenging because it's a scheme that's still being developed as it rolls out. So people are having different experiences in different parts of the country, but for the most part, it does seem to be positive. And it does seem to be about making sure that you're able to communicate what your goals are, what your needs are, and articulate them clearly. Again, having some support from Vision Australia if you need to help do that. Uh, and then once you get the plan, engaging with your local area coordinator or Vision Australia to make sure you understand it and access the services you need. Those are the sorts of things that help you make the most out of the NDIS. Um, as long as I think there's an element of being patient. It's something new, it's new for us, it's new for participants. It is something that takes a little bit of time for everyone to get settled with. And I would say that that's probably, you know, people be interested in uh, what's happening that's a bit difficult as well. And that's probably the biggest challenge that both organisations and clients have with the scheme as well is those time frames as well. So patience is definitely key with this new scheme as it rolls out. And as Scott said, it's developing as it goes. So that's probably the largest um, frustration that we would hear from clients is that the, the funding is very flexible. It's very goals focused and independence focused, which we're finding for our clients is very um, affirming as well. And it is very in line with the way that they're looking to have supports provided and they're getting that choice and control. But exercising that choice and control, particularly around reports, that type of thing, it can be a little bit of a longer time frames, just as the NDIS are trying to scale up um, this program nationally. Okay, fantastic. All right, we're just about at the end of our session, but uh, we've talked through a lot of material tonight around um, the, the process of um, joining the NDIS and pre-planning and planning and reviewing your plan and making the most of, of the supports that you get and things like that. So um, it's been really great to have expertise from both of you. I think you've, you've brought some really valuable experience to the table, which is great. I think to, uh, before we end the session, we might just do a bit of a recap cap of the various ways that Vision Australia can assist um, people who are blind or have low vision throughout this process because we've talked about various points along the NDIS journey if you like where we might be able to help. So Alita, did you want to do a bit of a recap for us of, of um, the types of support that Vision Australia can provide? Sure, no problem. So look, um, we have different types of support for the different areas of the NDIS journey that you're going on. Um, so we've got an assistance with general questions. So you might be thinking about the NDIS, that might be why you registered for the webinar, you're looking to get a little bit of information, but perhaps we didn't get to your question or your questions are coming up afterwards or when you're moving into the scheme. So we have a helpline, an NDIS helpline that Vision Australia has set up. Uh, the number will be sent out through our notes for everyone, but I'll have it here as well, which is 1300 88 7058. And that helpline can help 
as well with those NDIS general questions, as well as calling in to any of your local Vision Australia offices. They'd be more than happy to help. Um, you've also got access to assistance with your application. So we talked about that access request form when you're a new you're a new applicant and you're trying to get onto the scheme. So both the helpline and your local office is able to assist with filling that form out, understanding the types of evidence you might need, helping you gather it together and even submitting it. As Scott said, there are some accessibility issues with the pro NDIS process at the moment. So it's definitely sometimes helpful to have a little bit of a helping hand. Um, we're then able to do I guess that preparation before you're going to the planning meeting as well. So you can sit down with one of our service engagement consultants, which we have across our offices across Australia, and you can do that getting plan ready session, which talks through those goals and the types of supports that you might be looking for to achieve those goals. We're then also able to come along with you, if you'd like, to the actual planning session on the day, just to provide that support and make sure that you are able to have those needs recognised within that meeting. And then I guess once you're coming out and you've got your NDIS plan, we're obviously also an NDIS registered provider. So any NDIS participant can come to us um, and look to have services or equipment provided through their plan. Fantastic. Okay, um, I think it's about time for us to wrap up the session now. So uh, just in closing, I'd like to thank Scott and Alita both very much um, for your expertise and uh, a very extensive knowledge throughout the session. We've certainly gotten through a lot of questions, which is fantastic. Don't forget, if we didn't get to your question tonight, um, you can call that NDIS helpline number that Alita mentioned, or you can contact your local Vision Australia centre as well, and they'll be able to help you out. For those of you who might have uh, logged in a little bit late or uh, missed parts of the session for, for any reason, um, a recording of it should be available shortly afterwards. So if you registered for the webinar tonight, you will get an email with a link to that recording so that you can watch or listen to it again. I'd also like to thank Cass Strakosh, who has been working feverishly behind the scenes to make sure that we answer as many of your questions as possible tonight. So um, thanks very much to everyone. Okay, well, um, thank you everyone again for joining this intro to the NDIS webinar. And uh, we look forward to hearing about your experiences of the, the scheme as you go through. So please do let us know how you go. And as always, get in touch with Vision Australia if there's anything we can do to help. Thanks very much everyone and have a great evening. <laughs>